All right, it's time to talk about some Crusader Kings 3 because we've got some big action coming out in just a handful of days. This is the 5th when I'm recording this, and on the September 8th, on the September, on September 8th, the new event pack for Crusader Kings 3 Fens, Friends and Foes will be coming out alongside a free update called the Bastion Update. Now, this Bastion Update, uh, there are some cool things with character memories that we're going to talk about today, and we get a little bit of a hint as to, well, not a hint, but we get a way, uh, or at least a transparency into relationships and how they are formed with friendships. Then the friends and foe pack is going to expand on those friendships and allow for false friendships and stuff like that. A lot of intrigue when it comes to the kind of passive diplomacy. If you do want to go ahead and purchase or pre-order that, you can find a link to my Nexus store to support the channel uh, in the description and the pinned comment. But in this video today, what we're going to do is go over these really quick little... Um, these uh, dev diaries to talk about some of the stuff that is coming because I mean I I saw the friends and foes pack and I was like okay I mean that kind of seems cool but I'm actually really excited not even so much for the character memories and the relationships but mainly the AI the big AI overhauls overhauls that are coming with the Bastion update not with the DLC that will be released alongside it so we're gonna go through that here today um, keep in mind on the eighth I'm gonna start a stream with um, Lithuania, we're going to secure the Baltic Empire. So that's going to be a stream we're going to be starting on the 8th. I'll be doing a giveaway of the Friends and Foes DLC. So you can find that again on September 8th at 10 a.m. Uh, yeah, 10 a.m., 10, 10 a.m., 10, 15 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, so that's probably, if you're GMT, it's like, I don't know, that should be like 5, 6 p.m. around that time. Let's jump into these dev diaries here and have a little discussion about some of the stuff that's coming with the Bastion update. And again, there's a lot of fun stuff. So we'll start here with the most recent thing about the character memory. So characters will remember things that happened to them from important things like the births of their children, important battles, deaths of close ones, succession to more mundane things like event interactions with other characters during their childhood. And essentially, this creates this scroll, right? A series of events that kind of shows you what happened when and what kind of minor or major little things that are kind of appeared in your life. And I, I kind of find this cool as far as an immersive thing. It wasn't a feature I necessarily wanted or cared about, but now that it's being added in with the Bastion update and it will shake hands very well with the Friends and Foe update, uh, or I'm sorry, DLC, I think it's kind of a cool way to kind of give you a true, a tried and true scroll of your life. You know, at the end of your character's death, you can kind of see a little bit more transparency into how they lived their life up to that point. And I, I find that to kind of be a, a cool send off for that character. And you can find out, like, man, why does this guy hate me so much? And you can kind of go back through your scroll and find out a little bit more of what happened. Uh, one important difference to a character history, though, is that, that over time, some memories will fade away, while others will remain. For player characters and characters likely to become player characters, we err on the side of keeping memories longer, mostly because you're more likely to have a need of, of them as the game progresses. So you can kind of use them as a means to uh, leverage certain things in your, in your uh, character's actions. Memories can be viewed at any time by opening the memory viewer from the character window via a button in the same place as the kill list inventory and lifestyle. And again, here's just more examples. Log of the public memories of a non-playable character. So just to kind of show that off here. Um, but memories are not only there as a log for the player to enjoy. So this is the kind of where the system of behind this kicks in. The new system allows us to make use of memories that a character has both to trigger content and to make use of make use of in events this means that you may now find memories used in content that previously had to be vague uh, an assassin might now actually cite a specific slight you committed against their employer for instance uh, what this also means is that we are now able to create new content that is based entirely on your character having a certain type of memory or sharing a memory with another character. Last of all, I should mention that it is possible to export the memories of a character to a clipboard in order to share it. So. You can kind of think of this as a way to make your playthrough feel a little bit more immersive and a little bit more unique to your playthrough rather than just saying, I'm going to roll them up or I'm going to deliver a carpet for no reason because blah, 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 blah. Now the AI, basically, <laughs> the, AI is, the AI is being provided with motive <laughs> to, to kill you, more or less. So this kind of creates a, a quite literal paper trail of any connection you have to characters that would then interact with you in your life. And I, I find that to be uh, pretty fun. And, and interesting. Also, with relationship reasons, this gives us a little bit of transparency on why they're your friend. This is your friend. You discuss subjects of profound interest um, at a feast. Uh, this do this is do. 
uh, Du Gregora's friend as children got to play with the mayor and spinning top. Okay, so it kind of shows you why these people are friends, especially mainly for the AI, I guess is kind of a, a big thing here. Um, additionally, whenever a relationship is formed with game with is formed, the game notification will now not only say that, that it happened, but also why it happened. The reasons for relationship will then always be visible in this tooltip, clearly telling you how they became friends, lovers, best friends, nemeses, etc. In cases where a more advanced relation, such as best friend or nemesis, exists, we will show the reason for both the basic relationship and the more advanced one. So a best friend will keep track of both how you originally became friends and when you actually became best friends. And what I like about this, how many times do you have characters that are just rivals to you and you just don't really know why? So this is kind of a nice way to get a little more transparency on those relationships. Now, childhood events have also been revamped and they give a lot more and different and more dynamic rewards here, right? So you can see with the stolen keg, okay, well, this is gonna go for builder. Uh, this is gonna do reveler and uh, drunkard. Is that the drunkard one? No, that, is that the reveler one? Well, either way, you can see a uh, uh, gregarious or temperate child's perspective. So basically, you, you get a little bit more dynamicism locked into these traits rather than just saying, oh, this is what's gonna happen. We can get diligent gregarious. Oh, yeah, that's this one up here. Um, again, and it kind of has the further effect and further ramifications attached to each event. So, that, again, they feel a little bit more robust. The ambition part, uh, okay, another thing that we wanted to revisit in order to improve on how we deal with characters in the game world is the revamping of existing childhood personality events as well as the addition of 12 new ones. This will significantly alter what personality trait combinations are likely to appear, and this is going to be important for AI when we talk about it. It will open up some combinations that were previously impossible simply due to how the old events were growing up for growing up worked so i like that so the new trade combinations will be pitted against each other are these right here i'm not going to go through every single one of them but you can see stuff like diligent gregarious temperate we saw that above but zealous and ambitious and sadistic uh shy paranoid and craven oh oh my god i hope to god i never get that one that is that's that's a uh, super lose kind of lose and really lose like no that's not that's not a good one Lazy, gluttonous, compassionate, 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 but you get some fun ones here to like vengeful, deceitful, and then calm, or like honest, arbitrary, and impatient. So I'm really curious to see how a lot of these will play out because it also seems like it applies additional, um, they're, they're not called personality traits. They're called fame traits. I can't remember the, basically like, I'm a drunkard or I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a practiced party or I uh, like to hunt uh, those those traits so it looks like some of them will accompany certain situations as you kind of go through them so this is the generous fickle or arrogant that's one right here um, and again it seems like it further has ramifications to increase or decrease your um, stress depending on how the event plays itself out then the loyal and disloyal traits are pretty interesting here too which I think is kind of cool. Again, a, a great way to get a good le level of transparency on certain vassals and certain characters so you know how they're going to play out in your realm. Okay, this is the disloyal trait. Diplomacy reduction, but intrigue increase. Leech opinion obviously reduced. More likely to join factions, which have been changed in the Bastion update. Opinion of disloyal, opinion of loyal characters. Obviously, that kind of uh, goes without saying. Then loyal, look, a loyal puppy. Then diplomacy increase, and then leech opinion, and pretty much the counter of the, of the previous one. So I do love this little transparency on the way that relationships work. I like that we're getting a change to the childhood events because they kind of feel a little too min-max at, at one point. So I like all that. But moving into um, the populist factions, and I'm not going to go on this too much, but basically they're going to be revamped and changed as well. So they have a little bit more of a concise using. Like, like right now it's just kind of like, oh, okay. I've got certain soldiers that are going to join factions, and it doesn't really make much sense. There's no rhyme or reason to it. This guy's got a good uh, good opinion of me. Oh, his pro his military is really good, but this one's got really shit. Like, it doesn't make much sense. But this revamp will make it so that they are a lot better, and the uh, leaders make a lot more sense. Stuff like that. So, populist revolts used to only spawn with the leader as an available commander. Step one was to make the leader a bit better by increasing their martial skill and giving them some better traits. You are now going to be a popular leader for nothing after all. <laughs> They'll be slightly more threatening. Step two is provide them with multiple commanders. This is huge, right? A revolt should generally start with enough commanders to assign one to each spawned army. These commanders tend to be fairly skilled as well, simply increasing their advantage in battles. So 
uprisings will be more dangerous because you can't just simply go smash one out and get the leader because oh, okay i'm going to go fo focus this one down and there I go i just shut down the whole entire revolt they actually have better commanders they've got a better spread as you can see of uh men at arms at least so it's a little bit scarier than just simply throwing things to the wind look at this this, is a, this thing's got 10 um siege engines that's gonna actually that's gonna actually siege a city so the populist factions and whatnot that are going to be coming to the fore are going to actually be pretty scary. Um, also, the letter event. So now the vassals are allowed to join, we need to give the populist uprising additional military prowess. Otherwise, they would be trivial to fight against. The difficulty has been ramped up in multiple ways. The most significant change here is that their armies will no longer only have levies, like I was just saying. They'll generate some base men at arms. Depending on the terrain type, hills will be given archers, mountains will be given spearmen, and so on and so forth. This should ensure that they get an appropriate troop composition. As before, the amount of levies and men at arms depends on the holdings of the counties uh, participating in the vault, uh, revolt. Stronger holdings provide more troops, so on and so forth. Uh, additionally, armies will get some siege weapons that depend on the innovations of the culture as unlocked. So basically, as your vassals possibly join the populist faction, and as the populist faction starts to grow in having command, better commanders and men-at-arms, they start to become far more scary. So that is going to be coming again with the Bastion update. But the last thing I want to talk about here is the AI, and the AI is just juicy. So basically, they've they've improved three big things. Or they discovered they they said here's all the big things that we want to work on: changes to the economy, changes to the diplomacy, and changes to the way the AI approaches warfare. An economy, uh, to start off, is broken up now. It's got some archetypes. There are four economic archetypes that AI rulers can fall into, of which three are significant, warlike, cautious, and builder. If a character falls into none of these archetypes, they will be unpredictable and use aspects of other archetypes in a semi-random fashion. So basically, warlike is going to be focusing on offensive wars, as you would imagine, right? Bold and greedy AIs tend to be warlike. Common traits include wrathful, impatient, sadistic, ambitious, vengeful, irritable, and zealous. Tribal rulers and cultures with bellicose ethos are also drawn to this archetype as well as any character in the Iberian struggle that wants to escalate. So basically, lots of raiding, lots of offensive wars. Now, cautious is different. It is not so much raiding, but they are building defensively. So they are somewhat averse to declaring offensive wars, instead preferring a slow buildup. This archetype will save up a minimum buffer of gold depending on their tier. When in choosing to invest gold into buildings or men-at-arms, they will evaluate the state of their military, how long they've been at peace, how many allies, allies they have, and their level of dread. Depending on these factors, they will feel safe and invest more gold when they would otherwise while keeping the aforementioned minimum buffer. So it's, again, a, 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 an AI that is focused on defensive actions and actually takes those actions so again patient calm craven paranoid and content rulers would fall into possible uh cautious uh economic ai uh, uh archetypes then the builder archetype is well just as you would imagine they construct more economical buildings and new holdings than other archetypes they are bold they are bold a bit and a bit reckless only saving up a war chest if they are under a direct threat such as a strong faction this is the rarest of all archetypes and then common traits include calm, patient, diligent, generous, stubborn, uh, prolificate, and improvident. Where warlike AIs want to expand their realm, the builder wants to build up their domain. Rulers with the domain focus would also tend to fall into this. Then unpredictable has just got a, a smattering of all of them. Then you have these economic stages where they, they focus on early capital development, then early domain development, followed by later economic behavior. And this is kind of how that all spreads itself out across the live build and the test build. And they kind of just pretty much did a lot of these testings and saw how these guys would worry, would, would kind of basically build out their levies, build out their uh, monthly income, build out um, their counties, everything like that by focusing on those uh, aforementioned focuses with the, uh, the progression here, right? So overall, I think this is really good because I think the AI really suffered economically. It just was the same AI for the most part, and they would just kind of kind of noodle around. And as this comes into domain... Er, into, diplom into diplomatic matters, <laughs> we get another bit of things that the AI would kind of noodle around with, and it's dom domain consolidation. So the AI is now going to strive towards having a strong capital and domain, prioritizing first and foremost the consolidation of lands within their de jure capital duchy. For example, the King of France will, will want to hold Ile de France and all counties within the duchy of Valois. So 
Previously, you know, you'd, you'd have a lord who would just have a random smattering of counties across his entire realm. This is now going to be focused in the same way you should be focusing. Your primary title, your capital location, you should have the Dure Count, uh, Duchy, King, Emperor, you know, like it, it progress up. It should, you should have everything expanding out from that location. So it's going to be mirrored now with the AI, which I really, really like. And I think it's really good to see because it causes better stability and it's not as troublesome if you take them over, right? If you decide to um, do some kind of action, it'll be easy to just kind of get in there and take directly that duchy because that's what they hold. You're not going to take the duchy and they've got one county left and now they've got a single, it's a single count against you and it's just a pain in the ass. So now this is a little bit better. Um, and more streamlined. Vassalization, one of the things that we've changed a lot is how vassalizations work and how the AI uses it. This isn't a pure AI change as we've also rebalanced all the modifiers that affect whether a character wishes to accept your overlordship or not. But yes, simultaneously, we've taught the AI to consider these facts and try to make their neighbors into vassals, which is good. So it kind of plays into those uh, the AI stuff we talked about a little bit ago where some characters are not warlike. They're more, they want to be builders or they want to be cautious or maybe they're unpredictable. So I think this is good because now they'll actually try to just simply just do vassal ships and offer vassal ship to anyone that is de jure part of their, um, part of their lands, which is great. Now, another big one is holy wars, and this is huge. So as it turns out, rulers of the same faith as the defender in a holy war would never join in their defense, despite the game claiming they would. This is our bad. A set of triggers were looking at the wrong character and thus no one would consider joining. This has now changed and we've put some effort into ensuring that the rulers who join up against you feel right. And this is massive because now holy wars should actually feel like a good holy war and they actually do things and they actually accomplish something and it also depends on stuff like zeal right extremely zealous characters are going to really be gung-ho on the whole holy war and everything in practice you have to prepare well before declaring a holy war but taking stock of your neighbors will help you here personalities are telling so you shouldn't be overly surprised when someone aids your target so it seems to be that this is going to be a very very good improvement for holy wars realm stability also be is substantially increased with this patch ai rulers should now be somewhat more aware of the state of their realm and proactively try to improve its stability there are many flavors of stability some more underhanded than others so a lot of stable uh, stability will be occurring uh with the ai and you can kind of see how this works here so let's compare two areas one from a live version and one from the upcoming update they are 200 years from game start in fact they are the same saves used for comparison start stats earlier in the uh, developer diary so you can see in the live version, France breaks apart. Burgundy is all over the place. Aquitaine's here. Poland even has a little bit here. You can see Kent is across the, the channel. Wessex, England, Wales, uh, Jorvik. Everything is just all over the place. England, England, it's it's just a mess. England, 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 it's, it's, it's disgusting. But with the update, the stability here makes it so that things actually keep intact. And what it's really keen to point out here is that this doesn't say it's not saying that oh okay you're always going to see a strong france a strong england a strong scotland so on and so forth no it's saying that anytime there is a strong um random faction like, like it says right here it's always uh, it it's still as it's always been where you might have a powerful burgundy in the south or a wales controlling the british isles it's just that now the emerging burgundy in the welsh realms will be much stronger and able to thrive so if say hey england the english crown gets taken over and it's actually like not the godwins and it's like a random let's just say french person uh, and now they'll actually stay in power versus before if let's say you gave that title to a, a character and then uh granted them independence they'll keep their realm intact more easily than say before where oh, okay it's just going to fall apart because they don't have the immediate backing and it's going to automatically default back to the way the game wants it to be so i do like that and another big improvement is the mongolians the mongolians have gotten a huge improvement and it's a very simple one so now basically what's going to happen is when the ai goes to raise troops in any kind of war for the mongolians it's not going to raise troops in the far east or in the middle of their territory it's going to it's going to raise those troops troops closer to its war goal and look look at the look at the results so this is the game when it boots up here you go here it is right there initial state of the world and now here is a little bit forward look at the mongol empire grow look at it growing now 
Look at it growing even more so. Look at it at its peak. Uh Uh-oh. And even bigger. And the Golden Horde has been established. So I love this. I love that the Mongolians feel... Look at at that. Chagatai, the Ilkhanate, the Golden Horde. Like This is such a cool... All the white hordes over here too. I, I love how how this kind of changes the way the Mongolians interact on the map, and they even say like, "Hey, this is this is like all things are in a beautiful synchro." Uh, what am I trying to say? Basically, I'm trying to say like this is not this is a one like a rare one off, and it just to give you an idea of the power that the Mongolians can actually do if everything kind of goes right for them. Uh, like a lot of this, a lot of this kind of stuff happened because of. Um, uh, do your titles and being able to jump into one, grab one, and then just kind of cast it into another. Like you here, if you watch right here, where is it? Uh, 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 this is part of the Mongolian uh, uh, do your title, and then boom, it happens here. Some years, and note note that Tibet was taken because you had a, had land in Mongolia, so it just kind of like f- fell and cascaded right into it. But I do love a lot of this. I'm really excited for the Bastion update. I'm excited for the DLC. Again, we're going to be streaming on Thursday. 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're going to be playing in Lithuania and securing the Baltic Empire. So come on on, come on down, watch the stream. I've got a giveaway here for you guys. If you do want to pick the game up, pre-order, whatever it is, you can find a link in the uh, to my Nexus store. They're going to be getting that key directly from uh, Paradox and giving it to you so you don't have to worry about any kind of weird third-party bullshit, anything like that. Help support the channel. Help keep me alive, my bros. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.